Good morning. Good morning or good afternoon. I don't know which one I should use because some of our guests are in the United States, some of them are in Europe. So um, uh, I would like to welcome you on behalf of Georgian Institute of Politics. I'm Cornelia Kakachi, director of the Georgian Institute of Politics. We are delighted to have this um, very interesting discussion today uh, uh, about uh, Swedish and uh, Finnish uh, perspectives on uh, and uh, their application to uh, uh, for NATO membership. Um, this is very uh, interesting um, event, in, uh, especially for uh, candidate countries like Georgia, Ukraine, and other, um, especially because of these unfortunate developments which we have uh, in Ukraine and uh, because of Russian invasion in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, as you know, Georgia and Ukraine, uh, they are aspiring um, uh, for to become the members of NATO for already for a long time. Uh, and um, some people even were saying before the conflict that uh, at least in, 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 toward Georgia, that Georgia was actually de facto member of Ukraine, uh, of NATO uh, actually, because it um, participated in many NATO operations. Uh, but as you know, there is no political consensus. So within this background, it's of course very interesting uh, for uh, many Ukrainians and Georgians, um, uh, you know, the, how this uh, actually uh, this window opportunity, which was um, uh, opened up after uh, Ukrainian uh, conflict, uh, the new um, opportunities for Sweden and uh, Finland. And this is uh, more interesting for Georgians uh, and Ukrainians because uh, at least I remember that some of our Western friends actually were telling me the Georgians that maybe you should think also about the uh, you know the ways um, how to um, how to uh, to, to have some other alternatives, including neutrality, and they were bringing a uh, case of uh, Finland and, uh, uh, and Sweden as a good example, how to accommodate Russian geopolitical interests in the region, and now all this uh, kind of gone, probably, or very soon will be gone. So in that perspective, I think uh, today's discussion is very timely and very uh, probably it will be very interesting. First of all, I would like to uh, thank our guests uh, for their time. Uh, the, and uh, we will have a different perspective, as I see, uh, you know, also uh, from the countries itself, and then also uh, yeah, from the people who know a little bit more uh, about the transatlantic relations. And of course, they know the Georgia and the region generally. So I think this will be uh, probably a very fascinating discussion. Without further ado, I would like now to give floor to Katie, uh, who will actually moderate uh, our discussion. Thank you very much again. Right. Thank you very much, Corneli. Uh, good evening uh, to those of you who, in, who are in Europe, and good morning to the rest of you who are in the US. Uh, my name is Katia Mbokvadze. Um, I'm a senior lecturer at Lund University, and it's uh, my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this very timely roundtable discussion on Sweden and Finland applying for uh, NATO membership after Russia's uh, brutal war in Ukraine, what it means for the um, regional security paradigm, and more importantly, what it, uh, for audience of GIP, what it means for the NATO aspirant uh, countries like Georgia. We have a very distinguished uh, panelist today who are utmost experts on these issues. And I'd like to briefly introduce each one of them before we move to the discussion. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Siniko Kasari, who's a senior research fellow at Finnish Institute of International Affairs. She has previously worked at Finnish MFA as well as at the EU Institute for Security Studies in Paris. And her expertise includes EU's and Finland's policy towards Russia, Russian foreign policy, as well as uh, post-Soviet conflicts. Uh, next, we have Jakob Hedenskog, who is an analyst at Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies at UI, Utrike Politisk Institute, or the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. He has previously worked at the Swedish Embassy in Kiev, at Swedish Defense Research Agency, FUI, and has um, many years of experience studying Russia and uh, Eastern Europe. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Daniel Hamilton, a uh, senior fellow at uh, John Hopkins Foreign Policy Institute and non-resident senior fellow at Brookings Institution. Dr. Hamilton has previously held the Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation professorship at John Hopkins and has many years of experience serving both in academia as well as in the policy world. 
Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Tom Rosette, who's the head of the Ukraine program at the Norwegian Defense University College. He holds a PhD in international relations and has extensive experience on issues of Arctic security, Russia-China relations, intelligence studies and security policy analysis. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome Dr. Svante Cornell, who's the co-founder and director of the Institute for Security and Development Policy. Uh, his ma main areas of expertise are security issues and politics in Southwest and Central Asia, with specific focus on the Caucasus and Turkey. And he has authored many prominent books on the region, including uh, Small Nations and Great Powers. Few words on the organization of the roundtable. Each of our speakers is going to have about five to six minutes, um, and I'll be quite strict enforcing this uh, time, uh, to convey some of their main points around uh, NATO expansion towards uh, Nordic countries and what it means for the European security paradigm. Afterwards, we'll open for the discussion and uh, Q&A. So if audience members would like to ask questions, you can do so by using uh, the chat function in uh, Zoom. So warm welcome everyone again. And without further ado, uh, I'd like to give floor to Dr. Siniko Kasari. If you could share with us uh, how Russian war has uh, changed the perceptions of security among the Finnish uh, political elites and, uh, and the public. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ketavan, and thank you uh, for the invitation to join this uh, round table. I would just like to add one minor detail to, um, uh, to my CV, because I have also worked for the European Union monitoring mission for two years in Tbilisi as an analyst. So uh, that's also another aspect uh, that kind of um, links me to Georgia. Um, I, I could but not never do justice to all of you, all of your <laughs> Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, but, uh, um, but anyway, so just to talk about the uh, kind of the Finland's change of heart when it comes to NATO and NATO membership, um, I would still argue that uh, what we are witnessing now in Finland is really evolution rather than revolution. And I think uh, actually that the big paradigmatic change in our foreign and security policy happened already in 2014. And this is kind of continuation from there. And this is kind of taking the uh, process a step further in a way. And that actually explains the rapidness, uh, how you know very quickly the public opinion in Finland turned around completely um, and and so, uh, suddenly, you know, uh, the support for NATO membership was somewhere kind of 20% or even less than that. And suddenly, almost overnight, when the war started, uh, it kind of jumped to 60%, 70 percent, um, and you know, leading uh, to the point where we actually handed in our NATO application in Brussels. So. Um, uh, let me just highlight a few interesting points, I think, uh, in this process. Uh, because I think that since 2014 and uh, the illegal annexation of Crimea uh, to, uh, uh, to Russia, um, Finland was fully aware of the risks connected with Russia's foreign policy. And of course, as a kind of small neighbor, um, there was a sense that also we could not exclude the possibility of uh, Russia using military force against us. So that was written in all the strategic documents already back then. But our risk management strategy back then was different from today. We thought that kind of cooperating very closely with our Nordic, um, Nordic uh, neighbors um, and also kind of being as close to NATO as possible without being a member uh, would be kind of enough. Uh, trying to uh, guarantee that there is full interoperability uh, between NATO and Finnish defense systems and so on, that would be enough. 
And then, of course, we were fully aware, and in 2014, what really changed was the attitude towards hybrid influencing. I think not only in Finland, but all, all over Europe, but I think in particular in kind of countries neighboring Russia. So I think that we really uh, put a lot of emphasis on kind of um, this comprehensive security approach and um, whole of society preparedness against hybrid threats. And then I think that the third pillar was really the dialogue with Russia um, and also taking good care of the bilateral relationship. But then when the war started in 2022, and or actually already earlier, when Russia made these um, claims about um, uh, security guarantees, so to speak, um, and that uh, Russia demanded the halt in Eastern enlargement of NATO, that kind of really uh, destroyed the balance that we had built. And overnight, we had to rethink uh, kind of the basis of our foreign and security policy. So I think uh, after that, it was clear that, you know, European security is our security um, and that we should actually try to not just to look at our national security in isolation, um, and uh, but also seeing that, you know, whatever ev ever happens in Europe has direct impact in, um, in Finland as well. So I think two, two points really made the change, and that was really the ones that I mentioned. The, um, uh, the first one was the fact that um, Russia insulted, in a way, our sovereignty by claiming that there shouldn't be any enlargement. And we had always thought that uh, the NATO's open door policy would be a, a given fact. And if you know, that wouldn't be the case anymore, then, um, you know, one should try to join sooner or sooner rather than later. But then the other th thing is also that Russia has such a low threshold of uh, threatening with the use of nuclear weapons that uh, that has been also evidenced um, in Ukraine. And, and that, of course, is another thing that really shook the balance. So I'll stop there. Excellent points. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'll now move to Jakob Hedenskog. If you could share with us uh, more from a Swedish perspectives and also how is the security guaranteed in this interim period? We saw Boris Johnson visiting Magdalena Andersson in, in Stockholm. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Very good. Thank you, uh, Katie and Corneli, for organizing this webinar. Um, uh, I would say I agree with very much what uh, what Sinikuka said about uh, the continuation and revolution of uh, of the Swedish security policy in terms of NATO membership. But uh, I would say that no one expected really that the Swedish so social democrats would change their mind uh, in the question of NATO membership so quickly. The the party congress protocol from November 2021 clearly said that the non-alliance policy of Sweden is a foundation in Sweden's policy and that Sweden should not join NATO. So uh, we have had a neutrality policy already since at least 1834, although we, we violated it many times, uh, as you know, uh, especially during the Second World War and uh, during the Cold War, we we actually were collaborating closely with NATO all the time, but the official policy was that Sweden was a neutral country. And after uh, joining the EU in 1995, we changed our security doctrine from neutrality in favor of a non-alliance status. Uh, but anyway, when this change happened, uh, I would say that we were uh, very much behind Finland in the sense that Finland was more prepared, uh, as Cindy Kuka said, this, uh, the discussion on, on, um, on security guarantees or whatever that, that Russia raised, uh, it, it was much more, uh, uh, more debate in Finland uh, than in Sweden. And Nines, this, President Nines' uh, um, uh, New Year's speech uh, didn't get that much uh, attention in Sweden, unfortunately, that it, it, uh, it, uh, it would have had. Uh, so, so when the, the change came, it was very much that 
the, the Finland was ahead of us and we were reacting because um, Finland has always been the reason why Sweden before did not join NATO because Finland during the Cold War was more exposed to Russia or the Soviet Union at that time. And if we had joined NATO, it would have been much more exposed situation for Finland. Therefore, we kept this uh, neutral or non-allied status. And, uh, and when Finland changed mind uh, rather quickly, um, um, we had to follow, so to say. And, and even after, uh, two weeks after Russia's um, large scale invasion of Ukraine on the 8th of March, uh, the prime minister said that uh, a Swedish membership in NATO would destabilize the situation in Northern Europe, uh, even after the invasion. So, so it, it, it was, uh, we, we reacted rather slow, I would say, much, much um, behind Finland in this case. Uh, and uh, how is uh, the... Um, uh, first, there was a question on the implications of the um, uh, lessons of Sweden and Finland joining NATO for other aspirant countries. I think this would only be positive. Uh, memberships of Sweden and Finland would have a positive impact on the aspirant countries, whatever it, it would be Georgia or Ukraine or, or any other country, because Sweden and Finland are generally positive on enlargement issues, whether EU or NATO. And, and how is the security of guaranteed in the interim period. Well, uh, Sweden and Finland had received security guarantees from rather many countries as U US, UK, France, Denmark and others. And right now we have the Baltops uh, 22 military exercise in the Baltic Sea with 14 participating countries and the, some of the largest uh, warships in the world, such as um, the amphibious assault USS uh, uh, Kearsarge are actually now visiting Stockholm, central Stockholm. You can see it almost uh, out from outside my window. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's also in connection with Sweden's uh, celebration of, NATO, of its, uh, na the Navy's fifth hundred anniversary coinciding with the exercise. So uh, almost 30 Na NATO members States have signaled strong support for adding Finland and Sweden to the alliance, and only actually Turkey and President Erdogan uh, has had a very strong uh, thing to say uh, about it. But hopefully, it will be it will be sold um, um, before before um, uh, we can uh, join NATO. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob, for this uh, excellent point. I would just like to encourage everyone in the audience not to wait and send in your questions already now via the chat function in uh, Zoom. Uh, next, I'd like to move to Dr. Daniel Hamilton um, with questions more on what this means for the broader regional security paradigm and also what are the implications for uh, for countries like Georgia because Jakob mentioned this is this is a good thing could NATO also be reaching some sort of saturation point where you know accepting new members is maybe not conceivable please Dan thank you so much and uh, thank you for the invitation uh, so quickly I think the accession uh, means the open door, NATO's open door remains viable and credible. So that's an important message, I think, to send at a time of great uncertainty. Uh, but I think that one factor in the calculations in Finland and Sweden were they were seeing that there really is a difference between being an ally and being a partner. Uh, Ukraine is a, also an enhanced opportunity partner like Sweden and Finland with NATO, but NATO was not going to defend it. Uh, but it's going to defend, as leaders have said, every inch or every centimeter of NATO territory. I think that was an important message to Sweden and Finland. Uh, and I think that's an important message to other countries as well, that to become a member, uh, one has to create the conditions by which the consensus within the alliance is there. As Corneli said at the beginning, for countries like Ukraine and Georgia, it's not there yet. And it's not just about what NATO should do, it's also about what those aspirant countries will have to do. Um, but moving to the <clears throat> other question, uh, just 
since uh, speaking from a US perspective, there is huge uh, bipartisan support for Sweden and Finland joining NATO. Uh, both Senator, Sen and in the United States, that has to be ratified by the US Senate. It's, a, it's accession to the North Atlantic Treaty. So a treaty means two thirds of the US Senate have to agree to this. Uh, the US Senate usually doesn't do very well with treaties. Uh, but when it comes to the North Atlantic Treaty, uh, they, they have really uh, continued to, uh, to be supportive. So both Senate Majority Leader, Democrat, Senator Schumer, and Senate Minority Leader, Republican McConnell, have been very strong on moving this as fast as they can through the US Senate to deal with the, this you know, vacuum between invitation to the countries and uh, actual uh, membership. And many times that's been many months, if not a couple of years for some aspirin countries. They have said they wanna get this done in the United States by the summer recess. So that's the end of July. Uh, Mr. Erdogan might complicate that a little bit, but the plan is certainly to extend the invitation to the two countries at the NATO summit in June, later this month. And then uh, in the US at least to move very quickly, but there will be a gap because 30 countries have to ratify this or do it in there. And that'll be some, that'll be problematic. And we'll have to certainly see what happens. But your question was about the broader context um, for Georgia and other countries. So I think now that potentially we have two new members, there is a question of what NATO does with other non-NATO uh, member uh, partners. Um, and particularly in, in your part of the world, it, the, act, the aspirants, if you will, the candidates are Ukraine, Georgia, and Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, with some other partners, of course, many, many other NATO partners. But I think NATO at the, at the June summit in Madrid will have to have a message uh, for those partners. So I and uh, Sandy Birschbaugh, many, many know, former Deputy Secretary General and others have proposed what we call a secure neighborhood initiative. That is that NATO should be prepared, qua NATO itself, the institution, to provide whatever defense material and support uh, these countries need to defend themselves. So it would be basically everything short of Article 5. Um, and also provide a complementary uh, range of support to help these countries become resilient to disruption. So it's not just about frontal defense, military defense, it is also about resilience to disruptive efforts. Uh, we see Russia in particular is not only attacking Ukraine in a conventional way, it's disrupting Ukrainian society. It has been doing that for a long time. It tends to use Ukraine as a laboratory. Uh, the solar winds attack in the United States, you know, the digital attack that really disrupted much of the US society started as a not Petya attack in Ukraine. And Russian operatives see that if it works there, they can take it on the road. Uh, and cyber disruption is just one element. If you think about weaponizing the food supply right now, uh, Russia also weaponized migrants and refugees. Uh, so I, I think for, for us, and for me at least, the Black Sea region is sort of becoming emblematic of what I would call flow security not just territorial security, that the flows that keep our societies function are, are subject to disruption, uh, either by states, non-state actors, even mother nature. If you think of the pandemic, uh, think of climate change. We have to think harder about together about uh, flow security and how that becomes really an essential element. Uh, and it means resilient societies are the first line of defense in a way. And, and frankly, Sweden and Finland both have traditions in that area that they're going to bring to the alliance, which is going to help us. You know, my country doesn't have that tradition. We thought we always think our oceans protect us. So that's I think there are stuff to be learned both ways. Uh, but I think Georgia and the countries of the Black Sea, how, how do we work on, you know, uh, building resilience to these types of disruptive uh, issues? That'll be an important thing. So the Secure Neighborhood Initiative would include both the defensive elements plus the resilience elements in a package. 
so far that's being done mainly by individual NATO allies. The United States, for instance, and Georgia have a bilateral deterrence initiative. The idea here is to lift that to the NATO level. NATO as NATO doesn't do that. So that's the pitch is to say what the US has been doing or others individually should now be assumed by the NATO alliance itself in this secure neighborhood initiative. Uh, I realize that's not membership. I realize that's not always what uh, aspirants want, but it is a significant, it would be a significant uh, uh, step up from where we are uh, today. And it would put NATO as the alliance in the position of working with these countries, again, rather than let it be kind of a, you know, come as you can uh, approach that we're, that we're doing now. I don't know if something like that will be approved, but I think that's the way we need to think about it. And I just end by saying, in the end, however, NATO membership is, you know, starts at home. Uh, there was a reason why there was no consensus about NATO membership for Ukraine or Georgia, frankly. It is because of questions many countries have about the conditions within Georgia and within Ukraine and whether those conditions mean that those countries are going to add value to the alliance. In the, in the mind of a US Senator, the question is going to be, does this country add? Is it a net plus? It's a political judgment in the end. And whatever a country can do to make that answer yes, in the mind of a US Senator, is going to be, at least from a US perspective, uh, the real answer. Thank you. Um, thank you, Daniel. Um... I'll, I'd like to move to Tom Rosett now um, with very similar questions. Um, as someone who has been examining the security policy analysis for a long time, what do you think it means for the uh, broader regional security as well as for countries like Georgia? Please. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation, uh, Professor Cornelly and uh, GIP. Um, uh, I can take the uh, more regional uh, northern flank uh, perspective uh, first. I, I, with Sweden and uh, Finland in NATO, it will strengthen uh, NATO in the north, certainly. And um, they are both very capable uh, defense forces. Uh, well, they've been neutral and uh, had to. Uh, I've made the same cuts as many other NATO, NATO countries. And uh, we have had a Nordic cooperation for a long time and uh, all, with, with these two countries uh, and between Norway and, and these two countries especially and and we uh, they're very compatible compatible and uh, they're very um, uh, high on the NATO standards so it's it's a very easy and quick uh, process potentially and um, uh, in the north, uh, they will uh, make it more easy to deter Russia on the conventional side, of course. And uh, as uh, Dr. Sari said, uh, when it comes to the nuclear dimension, the US uh, or other NATO, uh, nuclear uh, states in NATO will uh, give added the momentum or added the security on on uh, deterring on the nuclear side uh, that's what uh, what these countries uh, lacked um and um uh, when you see on the map as well i mean the baltic area is is uh, will be very nato dominated and um uh, will uh, lead possibly uh, russia to uh, focus more on the uh, kola peninsula and um and the uh, Northern Fleet, uh, and that will be a challenge, possible challenge. But again, then again, I mean, uh, with with the stronger Nordic presence in in the Arctic, it will uh, after this phase of uh, if it if it's uh, if it's a phase, uh, it will be uh, more comforting for Russia to to uh, handle Nordic uh, military forces than, for example, UK or US, US forces in in, uh, in the Arctic. Uh, but that's uh, that's uh, uh, 
when I think of activities closer to, to the shore, of course, US and UK have their own interest up there that, that we won't interfere with. Uh, but um, uh, on, on the security side, in the interim period uh, for these countries, uh, I want to add something to, to that as well. And, uh, yes, this big giving, as mentioned, uh, security guarantees uh, and um, also from the Nordic uh, rest countries, uh, from Iceland, Denmark and, and Norway. Uh, so all possible means. Uh, but what does that really mean? I mean, it's not Article 5, obviously, because they're not a member. So it's uh, something else. And that's some ambiguity there. That's uh, And then also from the stronger um, NATO countries uh, like the US and, and uh, UK. But that ambiguity is something that uh, I think that's something that's good. I mean, for Russia, it will be difficult to assess how how that support will materialize itself if it thinks of disrupting uh, these countries' uh, membership process. So um, uh, another thing they can do is is uh, or NATO can do is is to perform exercises. Uh, uh, if invited by these countries, and uh, that will be sort of a tripwire uh, thing. I mean, uh, either at sea or, or on land um, in this interim period. Um, and uh, also they have the, they are European U Union members as well. So they have some sort of security assistance guaranteed through the Lisbon Treaty, but that is uh, also a bit ambiguous. So um, yeah, it's it's um, it's uh, uh, the Russian threat in that interim period is is uh, is there. But uh, as mentioned, I mean uh, on the hybrid side and also on the conventional side, they seem to be very very well prepared. And uh, Russian all flights uh, and things like that are are handled well and. Um, I don't expect any, uh, Russia is focused on the war in Ukraine and I don't expect any uh, disruptions, uh, serious ones. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for this broad regional uh, perspectives. Per perspectives. Um, I would just like to encourage everyone in the audience to not wait and send in uh, your questions. Next, I'd like to move to Dr. Svante Cornell. Uh, who knows both the, the Swedish perspective, but also knows Georgia very well and has lived in the US for a long time. Uh, so also very similar questions as to the other panelists, what it means for the broader security paradigm, but also what it means for aspirant countries like Georgia. Thank you very much. And thank you for organizing uh, the seminar. I have to say that uh, professionally speaking, I don't really focus that much on Nordic security as some of the people who have been part of this panel, but probably that's not why you asked me to participate in this either. So I will I will try to uh, provide some of the what I think are the potential lessons uh, for a country like Georgia that finds itself um, uh, wishing that it would be as uh, happily received in most NATO countries as, uh, as Sweden and Finland are right now. Uh, I, I'd say that the, I think the first lesson that this um, that that the, these few months have shown us is that opportunity can come at any time, and you have to be ready to grab it. Uh, of course, uh, the situation is different in Georgia, where there you know there was always a strong support for NATO membership. I don't think that's where the issue is. Uh, in Sweden and Finland, domestic support for non-alignment really evaporated, as we heard uh, Sinikuk and others mention here, which provided, a, I think, a historic opportunity for elites that whatever they said publicly probably knew that joining NATO was a wise decision. Even if you're, so to speak, on the left of the political spectrum, a lot of people were probably closet to NATO supporters, if you will, at least in Sweden. Um, so I think what we see uh, already happening from the Georgian perspective is that while not a lot has changed concerning NATO, uh, we see, for example, that there is a shift in how the EU is approaching Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, um, that the, uh, there has been a possibility to provide an application, at least, for, uh, for a membership perspective. Now, we don't see how this is going to go. I think they're going to be some kind of middling solution, uh, particularly because of situations within the Georgian political system that we perhaps can talk about another time. Um, 
but I think the, the point is that it's not inconceivable that a sudden shift at some point in, you know, it could be this year, it could be in five years, uh, could open the way for Georgia to, uh, to make a similar uh, jump uh, as, for example, Sweden and Finland are doing now. So the question is, when this opportunity comes, are you ready? Uh, and I think right now, the question in Georgia, the answer is probably no, uh, because the regression in Georgian politics in the past several years, the political bickering that's happening in the country, the role of an unelected oligarch in the political system, uh, all of this makes, to many people, Georgia look like a liability rather than an asset in the alliance right now, where, of course, this should not be the case. For a lot of obvious reasons, Georgia should be an asset to the alliance. Um, uh, if there was clarity in terms of how Georgia was governed, uh, how Georgia's political system was running, and how its foreign policy was being formulated. So I think that's one of the lessons. When the opportunity arises, you want to make sure that both in terms of domestic and foreign politics, your situation is such that you would be able to jump through the window, so to speak, and if the window opens. Um, <clears throat> and I think one very um, important lesson, which uh, turned out to be a problem, particularly for Sweden, much more so than for Finland, is that you should make sure that you don't make a single important member state, state uh, in, in NATO upset with you. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, the Swedish political elite was not prepared for the crisis that came in terms of its relationship with Turkey and the Turkish approach. Uh, perhaps they should have been prepared knowing how sensitive the uh, situation in Northern Syria is for Turkey and how that has been almost an existential uh, issue for the Turkish uh, political leadership. By the way, not just Erdogan, but the entire security establishment in Turkey from well, almost a decade, uh, especially from 2013 onward until today. Um, so I think, uh, the uh, the Swedish support for Kurdish causes, which has been very loud and very obvious, I think it was fairly clear this was going to be an issue. I, of course, didn't predict it would be an issue of this magnitude. But I think it's uh, it means, uh, you know, you have to make sure that your relations with major uh, NATO powers are, are not problematic. Um, I think uh, we can remember in uh, Georgia's recent past, there was a similar situation in a way where during Saakashvili's time and period, there, it was clear that Germany was particularly the problem and Angela Merkel personally did not trust Saakashvili. And I think this was one of the issues that put a break on Georgia's aspirations for closer Euro-Atlantic integration back in those, in those days. Today, uh, I, uh, there is no such similarly clear uh, problematic situation for Georgia. But I would say that, especially given the way Turkey behaved uh, recently. Uh, I think it would be very wise for Georgia to make sure to keep uh, a, a good relations with Turkey. I think Georgia is doing this. Um, but it seems to me that this would be key to the Georgian fortunes for a variety of issues. Uh, and if I look at issues that could be problematic and that could generate a similar Turkish reaction, the only really major issue I can find is uh, the, uh, the fact that there are elements in Georgia's political system, as we know, that are uh, seeking to foment some type of unrest and conflict with regard to Georgia's Muslim minorities. Uh, there, are, there have been uh, people not far from the government, and there are definitely people in the area of the Georgian Orthodox Church that are uh, not, should we say, quite positively inclined towards the Muslim uh, communities in Georgia. I think it will be very important for the Georgian government to make sure that this does not become a major political issue, uh, because that could lead to a similar reaction from Turkey. And by extension, I would say that now the, uh, the, the real issue for Georgia is not just Turkey, but also its relationship with Azerbaijan, which historically has been very positive, but which has gone through a few very unnecessary uh, periods of unrest with the regard to the monastery that crosses the border uh, and, 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 and a number of other issues. Because I would only exaggerate a little bit if I say that Azerbaijan is a de facto member of NATO. And what I mean by that, of course, is that uh, Azerbaijan has a the only country in the post-Soviet world outside of the Baltic states that has a that has a defense alliance with a non-Russia, with a power that is not Russia. And I think, by the way, that's one of the reasons that President Aliyev so recently was able to speak so openly and so directly about Azerbaijan's approach to the situation in Ukraine, because he has the backing of Turkey. But joking aside, of course, this doesn't mean that Azerbaijan is a member of NATO. But I think the, 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 the fact that you have a situation in the South Caucasus where, Georgia, where Azerbaijan and NATO member Turkey are in a very 
uh, close defense relationship that includes mutual defense treaty could not be, uh, I don't think there's anything that could be more relevant for Georgia at this time, because Georgia has been aligned and has a trilateral cooperation with Azerbaijan and Turkey. And it seems to me that the, um, this example, the Azerbaijani example, is one way for Georgia to think about its security. Uh, if NATO membership is not realistic in the short term, could it be, is it uh, a, an option for Georgia for a similar relationship that Turkey has with Azerbaijan to be extended to Georgia? Uh, would that provide a road to a closer approximation with NATO in the future? That, of course, depends on how NATO, Turkey's relationship with NATO in the longer term develops. But I think these are the type of creative types of thinking uh, that, that one has to engage in. Of course, I should mention that Azerbaijan does not desire NATO membership. Uh, ironically, they now have some type of security and defense assurances from Turkey. Georgia is looking for NATO membership, but it's further, it's as far away from such an Article 5 commitment as it's been in a long time. So these are not easy issues, but, uh, but there you are. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thanks to all the panelists. We have questions coming in. Um, so I'll start with the one that's, uh, I think, I believe to everyone or whoever would like to answer, please go ahead. Uh, so Georgi Magradze is asking, how would Sweden and Finland view the consistency of NATO member countries, especially Turkey, which seems to attempt to seize chances based on personal ambitions with Russia? Please share your thoughts. And I guess this goes back to um, Svante's point, but I'll, I'll also add, um, can Erdogan really derail the membership or is this just a matter of uh, haggling? Because Swante mentioned maybe countries like Sweden should not put themselves in the positions that they are right now, but uh, what are the implications uh, in the long term? I'll just throw this out to whoever would want to answer. I can start. Uh, I, I, I don't think that Sweden, the government or any in Sweden expected that the resistance uh, towards the Swedish membership in NATO would be more inside NATO than outside because uh, uh, Russia has been rather, uh, Putin has been rather, you know, he, he said that it's not a big deal and um, uh, membership for Sweden and Finland is not a big deal and, and so on. But uh, the resistance from Erdogan, they didn't expect it, I suppose. But I also think that um, uh, he will not be able to derail the membership. I think that this is too high a, a political price to pay to be alone when all other members, including the US, of course, is uh, for, for Swedish and Finnish membership in NATO and to stand, stand there and uh, uh, opposing it is too high a price for Erdogan. Right, thank you. Uh, we have seen Ikuka, then Tom and then Svante. Great, uh, thank you. Um, well, what I can tell from the Finnish experience is that actually Finland has rather good relations with Turkey and we have been one of the few EU countries that have been supporting uh, Turkey's EU membership bid for, for a very long time. And we also cooperate on kind of peace mediation uh, um, uh, initiative uh, and and they are uh, different things that we do together and also President Niinistö, the Finnish uh, president, talked with Edouan beforehand and actually uh, Edouan was assuring him that uh, Turkey will support the fin Finland's and Sweden's, I think that they were talking about the Finnish membership bit, that he will support that. So there is also this nasty fact that actually he lied um, uh, to our president beforehand. So it really came as a surprise because everything was supposed to be already kind of prepared. Um, uh, so this is a difficult issue, I think. And I think it's even more complicated now with the kind of um, governmental crisis in Sweden, uh, because I think that the process does go together um, and, and I think that in Finland, there are even speculations that this might not be about months, but this could be even about years. And that is also very interesting because, uh, uh, because before, before the application was actually handed in, we thought that this kind of gray period is 
uh, something that should be kept as uh, short as possible and it's a period of great danger but in the end I think now <laughs> kind of the feelings are kind of settled and I don't think that anyone is talking about grey period anymore now that we see that it's going to take a while um, and I think uh, uh, you know when it comes to for example hybrid influencing uh, it doesn't go away with NATO membership. I mean, it is there and will be there even after that. So, you know, we have to be, uh, we have to be prepared for that. And, you know, when it comes to military threats, uh, we do have our national defense forces. And this is what we have been re uh, relying on even before. So the situation is not actually that different from from what it was, but it's very unfortunate to say the least. Thank you so much. Uh, Tom, please go ahead. Thank you. Yes, uh, I agree with the two other com commenters on this. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it will take uh, time, uh, some time. Uh, how quick? Uh, that will depend on, on the bilateral uh, negotiations. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, the uh, Turkish opportunism is uh, satisfied in some way, um, but also the trilateral uh, negotiations is, and then with that meaning uh, Sweden, Finland, uh, the US and Turkey, uh, there is a possibility that the US can, can smoothen and uh, soften the, the uh, stance in, in uh, Ankara, uh, but uh, possibly by giving for example, F-16 flights, uh, fight jet, jets, and things like that. But uh, but um, it's uh, it's an unfortunate situation, and um, and I think the Finnish uh, example is very good. I mean, uh, they did what they were supposed to do. I mean, they they, they talked to 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 Moscow and to Ankara, and uh, suddenly this came up. And I think it also was a surprise for uh, for. Uh, the NATO HQ in in Brussels uh, that this uh, came up. Uh, so the Turkish side were holding the cards very tight to their um, to their chest, and uh, possibly, uh, I mean, uh, oh, this is a personal uh, issue for Erdogan or or uh, a smaller circle uh, that didn't uh, inform others. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Svante, please. Uh, I would, I mean, to the question whether this can, uh, whether they can derail membership, I think the question is absolutely yes. Um, I don't necessarily think that will happen, uh, but I think there is a dangerous tendency in Sweden, at least, to think that this will somehow resolve itself and the United, the Americans will put pressure on the Turks and that's going to resolve it. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that at all. I think the, uh, there is, this is probably targeted at the United States as much as it's targeted to Sweden, because if uh, Sweden has been supportive of the Syrian Kurds, well, that doesn't compare to the level of support active military and otherwise that the United States has done. So I think it's clear that, and I think one of the advisors to President Erdogan said this very openly, that we, hadn't, we haven't had any leverage with the United States and with NATO before uh, to get our so-called allies to have a change in behavior on an issue that we consider to be existential, and suddenly they found leverage. I don't think they're going to let go of this leverage very easily. Maybe some kind of horse trading deal will be made, but I definitely think that this is something that is very serious from the Turkish side. Whether or not this came up as, a, as an afterthought or whether this was the military uh, intelligence bureaucracy pressuring Erdogan to suddenly raise this issue, I'm not sure. But I think this could vary. This is a, I think this is a more serious issue than most people in Sweden seem to think. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm chiming in here. I see there was also a question for me. Uh, maybe I can just answer it. I, and I apologize. I'll have to leave uh, just after that. Uh, I have a different commitment. But, you know, if the Turks think that they have gained leverage with the United States, they really don't understand the, the U.S. Congress. Uh, the U.S. Congress has to approve, uh, you know, these military sales. Uh, the Turks want this uh, fighter jet, but at the moment, the Congress uh, view of Turkey is not high, let's put it that way. And they interpret, they view Turkey through the prism of what it's doing with Russia. 
So while Turkey has supported Ukraine and done a number of things like that, it also has bought you know, Russian uh, systems uh, despite US objections. Uh, I think it's, it's actually backfired on Turkey. I think there's less willingness. Turkey has less leverage now, not more in the United States. And there's no horse trading that's gonna happen. It's really not about President Biden, it's about the Congress. One has to understand how our system works. So I don't see it. Uh, and so it, we come back to the issue that Turkey says is the issue, which is how Swede, Sweden in particular deals with the Kurdish issue. And I'm, you know, uh, we have Swedish colleagues here can tell us, but I think that runs deeply into coalition politics in Sweden and even the existence of the government going forward. So uh, I think Sweden has to take a hard look at uh, its, its stance on Kurdish issues and understand what it might have to discuss with Turkey. That's a tough discussion. Uh, but I think it's really, we have to focus on those kinds of issues rather than think that the US is gonna pull a rabbit out of a hat and solve this for everyone else. It's just, that's not the way it's gonna work. Um, the question I saw was about relations with Russia going forward. I mean, my view, uh, unfortunately, is uh, when people like to say, how will this conflict end? You know, what's the, I don't think it ends. I don't see an end. Um, I don't see that the Ukrainian president uh, could sign away chunks of Ukrainian territory and still stay in power. Uh, the Ukrainian people are beyond that. They're not going to accept it. And I don't see a way for Russia to accept uh, some settlement uh, that essentially evicts it from territory. So I, what I only see is a contested line of control based on where forces on the ground are cutting through Ukrainian territory. Uh, there may be a ceasefire, but that ceasefire will not hold. It'll be interrupted you know, sporadically probably. Uh, as each side seeks to gain some advantage. Uh, the Black Sea dimension of this becomes hugely problematic. You can see what's happening with the food issue, but an unresolved, not a frozen conflict, a festering wound, a festering wound in the, in the heart of Europe that's gonna continue for as far as the eye can see will affect all of our security calculations going forward. And I don't limit it to Ukraine. I, you know, Russia's tactic, including with Georgia, has been to have you know, these so-called frozen conflicts, which are not. Uh, so it can manipulate politics within neighboring societies. It has troops in every one of the Eastern partnership countries, so much for the EU strategy. Uh, talk about the need to rethink things. Uh, and I think this is, so the relation with Russia, that was the question, are not good not gonna get better anytime soon. We're, we're entering an age of disruption that I've tried to explain, and it's gonna be marked by persistent confrontation with Russia uh, uh, and a multi-dimensional challenge coming from China in particular that's different, but it's, it's part of the picture. I think that's the situation we're facing. NATO is gonna unveil this strategic concept in a few weeks. It'll have to address that broader dimension. And the one thing for Sweden and Finland that's, you know, at least to keep in mind, they're joining a moving train. NATO doesn't stop and wait for these two countries to say, well, how will you think NATO should now operate? It's, it's making decisions and Sweden's going to, and Finland are going to join the train when, when they can get on it, but they will have, NATO will have made a whole bunch of decisions before that point. And that's the NATO they're going to join. And I wouldn't be surprised to see you know, a turn to uh, de de deterrence by denial in NATO territory, not a tripwire deterrence that has huge implications for certainly NATO territory, uh, but uh, also in Southeastern Europe on the Black Sea part of NATO territory. That's unfortunately what I see as the issues going forward. And I apologize for having to leave, but I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your time and this excellent comments. So Dr. Daniel has to leave. Um, we had a question that was directed to Daniel, but I think this is actually relevant to, to, to the rest of you. So um, if we can start with Sinikoka, because you also have to leave. 
Uh, but I'll take up the, the, the same question. So the question was from Nino Samparadze, how do you imagine relations between the US and Russia if the Nordic enlargement of NATO happens in the upcoming months? And can this process impact Russia's ambitions over Georgia? Because you also know the uh, Georgian perspective and uh, Eastern Europe and the conflict. So uh, please, if you could share your thoughts on this. Okay, thank you. So, um, well, I mean, I cannot but agree what Dan just said when he left, um, that indeed we will have an enduring conflict uh, in Europe for a long time. And I really don't see uh, anything uh, significant happening at least um, until Putin is, gone one way or the other um, so somehow i don't think that there are really um, such possibilities to really kind of relaunch the relationship with russia uh, anytime soon so unfortunately my picture is almost as gloomy as dan's earlier so um, um, uh, and when it comes to russia's ambitious over georgia uh, I wonder what exactly is meant by this. Uh, perhaps does it mean like a kind of renewed conflict or, well, annexation obviously of, of South Ossetia uh, or, and or possibly Abhasia, I don't think so, but South Ossetia, well, that definitely could be in the cards um, and how much that would change and shake the balance in Georgia, I mean, I'm sure that the, uh, there are plenty of Georgian people ca that can actually answer that question much uh, better fashion than I can. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll let Thank you go you. now because I know you have to join another meeting. Uh, but I'll move with the same question to the rest of you, Tom, Svante and Jakob, if any of you would want to take this issue? Yeah, I, I can start. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a gloomy picture. I mean, uh, what we see uh, with the war, I agree, uh, it will be a, a conflict that we will see over a long time period, and uh, it will be more static front lines uh, along the east and south of Ukraine, probably. And uh, this uh, this will I, I agree with Hamilton that this will be possibly with some uh, some uh, uh, peace uh, no not peace agreement but uh, weapons uh, uh, a cease uh, ceasefire uh, period uh, now and then but uh, but it doesn't seem uh, uh, feasible for a long time as long as the political will is so strong in Moscow and also in Kiev for for uh, progressing on the ground so. But I, I, I'll, um, I'll also agree with the, with the, sorry that that uh, uh, we will have a new situation of, in Europe for a long time. You have a more antagonistic Russia uh, in opposition uh, to, uh, to to NATO and, and Europe, and then you will have a um, uh, not a new Cold War. It's a warm uh, war within uh, Ukraine, limited to Ukraine, but it will. Uh, create an uncertainty and dynamic in Europe that will be uh, challenging for some time before it settles in some way. And with this, uh, uh, Finland and Sweden will, will join NATO at some point. And, um, and uh, we will have a weakened Russia. I mean, a military weakened Russia for some time. Uh, possibly it will take uh, Russia 10, a decade or so to, to rebuild uh, its military. Uh, how will Russia behave in that period? And that's the that's the big question. And the other question that is very uh, very vital is is uh, how the end game in Ukraine will be if it if it uh, materializes. And if Russia wins, uh, the security situation is is more uh, um, unsecure for Europe in the long term. If uh, Russia loses. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it will um, uh, uh, 
be a more secure situation but still you don't i mean uh how russia will behave is still uh, still a, a difficult question uh but the the one white thing in and consequence of this war is how it will be perceived by other authoritarian uh, regimes uh, but how russia will behave uh, towards uh towards georgia as a weakened military power well uh, maybe it will be more uh, desperate. Maybe it will be more uh, reluctant. Uh, I'm not sure. Thank you, Tom. I would just like to uh, remind the audience, if you have questions, please, we still have 10 minutes left. So uh, you can send your questions via the chat function. But we still have Svante and Jakob. And if you could uh, take up the, the issue of Russia's behavior after uh, Sweden and Finland joining NATO? Well, I don't know that there is, uh, I think, I don't necessarily think that that's going to be a very big issue because Russia has seen these countries, at least Sweden definitely, but increasingly Finland also as, as Western and a part of the NATO alliance. And they knew the Sweden's ties with NATO during the Cold War much better than the Swedish population did, by the way. Um, but I think with regard to Georgia, it seems to me that, uh, Russia, um, 14 years ago, almost um, started something. It didn't finish that job. Uh, that job got finished halfway, if you will. I don't think, uh, and by the way, I am increasingly convinced, as I was to some degree already after the war in 2008, that Russia really wanted to go further into Georgia and possibly into Tbilisi, not necessarily in order to occupy Tbilisi, but in order to force the Georgian government in humiliation out of the capital, for example. That didn't happen for a variety of reasons, but I think what we saw happening on the Russian route to Kiev, to me, increases my conviction that that was in 2008, the, Georgia, the Russian approach. Instead, Russia focused since 2012, at least on a policy of softening Georgia and changing Georgia's uh, behavior, which by the way, includes the fact that for, for a decade now, Georgia really hasn't had much counterintelligence happening. And there has been a very large return to Russian uh, security services running around Georgia doing a variety of things, some of which are very obvious and others that are less obvious. So that seems to me that if you look at the, the list, uh, the laundry list, if you will, of, of Russia going forward, Let's say that there's some kind of ceasefire in, in Ukraine where they achieve something, but not all that they want. At some point, uh, I think Georgia is fairly high on the list of countries that Georgia that Russia is interested in, 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 in doing something about. I don't know if that necessarily means a military way, but I think it really means that it's very urgent for Georgia to strengthen its own integrity and its own system of government and clarity in its foreign policy, as I mentioned earlier, because the, Ru the Russians are not done. Right. Thank you, Svante. Uh, Jakob, please. Yes, I agree with previous speakers. We have an uh, antagonistic Russia. We have a uh, uh, long period of conflicts towards us in Europe. And uh, I, uh, I extend the problem uh, even beyond uh, Putin, because I think that the, if uh, Putin will, will leave us, uh, hopefully sooner than later, he will not be uh, there will not be any more liberal or uh, Western friendly leader uh, after him. What we might uh, be uh, hoping for is a um, conflict within the elite of Russia and that Russia will be uh, uh, exposed by, uh, by itself uh, for a time at least. Uh, as for Russia's objectives in Ukraine, I don't see that Russia has left its initial objectives of uh, capturing Kiev, regime change in Ukraine, or whatever, taking most or all or all of Ukraine. So that is also something that that will be. It's a long, it's a long, it's a long process, and it would if there will be any ceasefire or whatever, it would just be some. Russia will try it again and again to to get what its uh, the initial objectives were. Thank you. Excellent. We still have five minutes and we don't have any more questions. So I'll just take a liberty to ask the question. Uh, we discussed the security guarantees uh, towards Sweden and Finland. Um, looking at this from the Georgian perspective, what do you think Georgia could learn when it comes to negotiating these sorts of uh, security guarantees? Uh, bilaterally 
and maybe outside NATO for for this uh, period. If any of you would want to jump in. You're going to have to point at people. <laughs> OK, Svante, if you'd like to. Well, if you're asking about bilateral security, I don't think there are any bilateral security guarantees for the simple reason that doing so would uh, undermine the, in, the difference between being a NATO member and a non-member. So that's why when the Swedish foreign minister was in Washington, she came out speaking about the security assurances that had been received, which didn't translate very well in Swedish, by the way. Uh, but I think the we don't know what this means. And I think maybe that's good. Maybe this constructive ambiguity about what it is that the United States and the UK in particular are prepared to provide does not need to be told to the Russians, you know, uh, they let's uh, keep them guessing, if you will. But if, I, I think the statement that was sent by sending what was basically an aircraft carrier into the Stockholm Harbor, I saw it there and I don't know how it got in there. I don't know how it got out because it was so large. Um, it seems to me that that's a very clear statement sent by the by the United States. And I, I, I think we are going to see a much more uh, regular presence of, uh, of NATO militaries in the Baltic Sea and to begin with. Um, that's what I can see for the for the foreseeable future. Right. Thank you. Tom, you would like to uh, share yeah, your I, this. I, I agree with the with Svante on the ambiguity and I, I, as I mentioned earlier so as well. And I, I um I think it's important for Georgia to to uh, like uh, Svante said earlier as to be ready when the time comes when the window is open if it opens and and uh, we also see uh, that it's very important to to uh, to have a good relationship with uh, most NATO states maybe some more than others and um, and uh, to be compatible, uh, increase uh, the competences of uh, your forces, uh, modernize uh, NATO standards, um, operational procedures, uh, things like that. That that will, as within Finland and Sweden, that will pass in the process. Uh, so that interim per period is not so risky if it if it arrives. And, uh, and we also see that the, the geopolitical situation can change very fast and make changes within your population on how how the NATO is uh, membership is is perceived and uh, how strong support there there will be. Um, and uh, another important factor, as mentioned, was the was the internal politics and and um, issues within Georgia. Um, um, uh, so, uh, well, timing, um, uh, that's, that could be essential, uh, and this war, uh, how, however, how, it, and how it will, uh, will, uh, change things. That's, uh, something we do not know yet, but, uh, think can happen fast. Thank you. Jakob. Well, I was just going to say what Tom just said by the end that it's important not to let the NATO issue, whenever it comes, be hijacked by internal politics, as we see now in Sweden. Uh, so solve the problems uh, inside Georgia and uh, be uh, uh, to, to keep a, a joint, uh, you know, uh, efforts to 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 join NATO. That will be a, um, a lesson to learn from us. Excellent. We are unfortunately running out of time. So I would like to thank our panelists for sharing their insights and for a lively discussion. Uh, and of course, uh, to the organizers of this event, GIP and Corneli. So thanks to all of you and let's hope for the best both for Sweden and Finland, but also for aspirant countries like Georgia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.